Income tax 2022-2023 information returns. Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Most of this information comes from the tax guide for small business for individuals who use Schedule C publication 334 tax year 2022. You can find on the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, we're focused on line one income. Remember in the first half of the income tax formula, is in essence an income statement, but just an outline, just a scaffolding, other forms and schedules flowing into these line items. For example, the Schedule C, the small business form, in essence, an income statement in and of itself with income minus expenses or business expenses and the net income flowing into here, line one on the income tax formula. First page of the form 1040, we're focused on line number eight, Schedule C would then flow into the Schedule 1, which would flow into here, the first page of the Form 1040. Here is a Schedule C, profit or loss from business, where we could see the income and expenses, in essence, an income statement, income. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course, each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it minus expenses information returns what are they how do we deal with them if you make or receive payments in your business you may have to report them to the irs on information information in returns to understand them let's first take a step back think about the tax system we have an income tax system income then is bad for taxes obviously income is good in general but if we have to report the income it's going to increase our tax bill generally the irs has an incentive to try to verify the income that we are reporting to make sure that we're paying the proper amount of taxes when you look at normal financial transactions there's usually going to be someone providing goods and services someone's paying for the goods and services the person providing the goods and services is going to be receiving money generally cash for the goods and services that they are providing having income which is good for them but it's also a taxable possible event if they're most likely going to have to report that income the one that's paying for the goods and services may get a deduction possibly if they're a business and not not an end user meaning if you're paying for like a haircut then you don't get a deduction for your haircut generally unless you're a politician or something maybe you get a deduction for your haircut i don't know but if you're a normal if you're a business that's paying for goods and services to another business or contractor then you might get a deduction for it which means that would be a tax benefit so it's it's a bad thing because you have to have money going out you're paying for goods and services but it might be good for taxes because you get a deduction, the IRS has leverage on the payer in the transaction because they're the one that wants to get the deduction. So that means they're gonna be able to say, if you want the deduction, we want you to report the income to us on who you are paying. This is most clear in an employee, employer situation, which is why generally, if you think about the tone of what the IRS is saying, they usually want businesses structured in an employee, employer situation so they can have the most control over the employer to not only report the income that they're paying to the employees, but do the withholdings on the government's behalf. But if you don't have an employee employer situation, then they still possibly might want information on who you paid, such as processing the 1099 forms, right? So that's another format where they're saying, we're not gonna make you do withholdings, but we want you to tell us who you gave the money to. And if you don't, we'll penalize you. And again, they have the leverage on the person that is paying so that the recipient of the money, they can double check and make sure that they're reporting their taxes. So that's the general structure. That's, you always kind of want to keep that framework in mind. The IRS used to have a system more of an audit type of system, kind of like if you were on a freeway 
and police officers are pulling people over for speeding. They're not going to catch you every time you're speeding, but if they do catch you, then they're going to have a ticket that's high enough that it's going to prevent you from speeding. Audits used to be similar. They used to basically random, random audits used to be the primary tool that they would have. And if they audit you and catch you then cheating, then they would have penalties on it. But now more and more, they're becoming more intrusive, meaning they want to get the information beforehand. And they can do that by getting inserting themselves within the financial transaction, requiring where they have leverage, which is on the payer side of things, to report more and more on who they're paying the money to. So that's generally what we have here. So the IRS compares payments shown on the information returns, which each person's income tax return to see if the payments were included in income. So you must give a copy of inf information return you are required to file to the recipient or pay payer. In addition, the forms described below, uh, you may have to use other returns to report certain kinds of payments or transactions. So notice when you think about 1099 forms and W-2 forms for that matter, we think about them as something we have to give to, to the person that did the work kind of to help them generate their tax return. And again, that's usually the perspective that's going to be the angle that will be given when you're like researching this from the government, of course, as well. But obviously what they really want is for you to give that information to the government, right? So that they, so they have the 1099, so they can double check that the person is reporting that income on, on their taxes. So for more details on information returns and when you have to file them, you can see the general instructions for certain information returns. You can find that on the IRS website. So we got the form 1099 miscellaneous. So this used to be the standard form for contractors and then they put another one out there for the contractors, but this one's still a common use form. So use form 1099 MISC miscellaneous information to report certain payments you make in your business. These payments include the following items. So rent payments of $600 or more other than rents paid to real estate agents. Then we've got prizes and awards of $600 or more that are not for services such as winning a TV or radio shows, royalty payments of $10 or more. Uh, it's pretty low threshold. <laughs> Payments to certain uh, crew members by owners of operators of fishing boats. Amounts paid for the purchase of fish for resale from any person engaged in the business of catching fish. So apparently, I, I'm, I don't know much about the fishing industry, but there's some special rules oftentimes with regards to fishing related practices for some reason. So you also use form 1099 miscellaneous to report your sales of $5,000 or more of consumer products to a person for resale anywhere other than in a permanent retail establishment. Then we've got the form 1099 NEC. This is probably the most common 1099 that you that most small businesses may be required to report information returns. Remember, we're not talking here about receiving the 1099. You might receive these 1099s as well. That means that, that someone else is reporting them to you. And let's just kind of recap the structure of this. When would this happen? If you're receiving a 1099, that's because you're in a small business, most likely where you did work for other businesses, right? You did work for another business as a contractor. You are not a, a business. You're not a corporation yourself. You're not like an S corporation or, or a, you're not incorporated. Therefore, they were required to give you a 1099. And when you record your income, your income, you would think have, would have to be equivalent or greater than the amount of the 1099s you received. Otherwise, you would think the IRS would question your uh, your situation. That would be the, the general side on the receiving of the 1099s. Now, if you do business and you don't do business and your customers are not another another company, but you're like a hair salon or you're a restaurant or you're a massage parlor or something like that, where you're doing business for the end customers, not another business, then it's likely you're not going to receive the form 1099s from the customer because the IRS no longer has leverage over the payers because people that are getting their haircuts or buying a drink or something like that aren't required to give a 1099 to the bartender or to the person that owns the, the chair that has their own business or their massage table, right? 
So, so that, so you're not going to get a 1099 in that case. It doesn't mean you don't have to report the income, but it just means that you're, you're not going to have a 1099 and the IRS has less control over those industries, which is why, you know, I don't think they, you know, they don't like those industries as much. They would like to have more control over those industries, which is why they tried to shut them all down during COVID. I think, I don't know. I'm just kidding. But in any case, so, so then on the other side of things, if you hire someone as a small business, then you have the benefit of being able to deduct the, the contractor expenses. So you have to determine who did you pay. Now, if you paid like the phone company, like a big corporation or the utility company, then the IRS isn't concerned with you issuing a 1099 for Edison, giant Edison phone company. They have their own, they've got their hooks into Edison already. They, they, they don't need you telling them that you paid Edison, you know, 30 some dollar, like a hundred dollars. But if you're paying, a another contractor that isn't incorporated then the iris doesn't have their hooks into them as much and they want you to report anything over like six hundred dollars to make sure that other contractor is paying their fair share of the, of the income tax so that's how it generally is going to work here all right so file form 1099 nec non-employee compensation for each person in the course of your business to whom you have paid at least 600 dollars during the year in service performed by someone who is not your employee including parts and materials so notice if they're your employee then you're, you're still going to be reporting on them you're just going to use the w-2 form not only are you going to be reporting on them but you're required you're required to withhold from them and that opens up the other issue of if you're hiring someone as a small business, do you want to hire them as an employee? Do you want to hire them as a contractor? Do you want to take them on as some kind of equity partner uh, taking taking a piece of the profit sharing? So the questions would be if they're if they're an employee, you have less control. I mean, you have more control over them in that situation but you have to deal with the W-2 and the withholdings and all that kind of stuff. If they're a contractor, then you still have to issue them the 1099, but you don't have to deal with all the other kind of payroll stuff, although you have less control over them. In that situation, they're more likely to leave possibly or whatever comes up, comes up. And then if, they're, if you hire them as a partner or you take on a partner and give them an equity interest, you need to be careful on that because that could push you from reporting on a Schedule C to having a partnership business and obviously their decision making in the partnership is something you might be liable for within the partnership so you want to be very careful of that because a lot of small businesses you have one visionary that is kind of th knows what to do within the business and it actually works well from in a non-democratic system right with a little small a small business often has like one person that knows the direction that they want to go in. And when you turn that into a committee with a bunch of people that have different directions, it becomes a, a problem. That doesn't mean that as things grow, things obviously change and the form, the structure of the whole organization has to change because the specialties will change and whatnot. But you wanna be careful when you're thinking about taking on a partner because you might have different ideas about what's going on with the partnership. Also, you got to be careful in terms of uh, can someone qualify as a contractor or an employee? If you classify someone as a contractor, then the, the government's going to try to get them as an employee. Because remember, the government wants you to be their tax collector. So 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 if you, so you want to make sure that if they're a contractor, you've they definitely qualify as a contractor, even if you were to be audited and questioned about that. Okay, so cash payments for fish or other aquatic life and purchase from anyone engaged in the trade or business of catching fish. So we've got that fish thing again going on here. Special rules for fishermen. You gotta, you gotta know your taxes, fisher people, because <laughs> there's a lot of special rules for you guys. Payments uh, to an attorney. Okay, so you must also file Form 1099 NEC for each person from whom you have withheld any federal income tax reported on Box 4 under the backup withholding rules regardless of the amount of the payment. So in other words, if they're an employee, you have to be the tax collector. The government's going to force you to gonna make you be their tax collector. You withhold the money, you pay it to them for your employees. But if you have a contractor, 
Typically, the government's not going to force you to be their tax collector, but they still want you to rat out who you paid the money to with the form 1099, giving the IRS the social security number, amount you paid them, and their address, right? So they can go to their, they can go collect on their own. But, but if you can't give them that information, like you can't get the social security number, you can't get the, their address or their proper name or something like that, then the IRS wants you to withhold. They want you to withhold the money because because you're not you're not ratting out the person that you paid properly. And so they're gonna they want you to make sure that you're the one that's withholding the money as if they're kind of like an employee so that they get paid that way. So caution. If you use form 1099 NEC to report sales uh, totaling five thousand dollars or more of consumer consumer ed. products then you are required to file form 1099 NEC with the IRS by January 31st. Form W-2. You must file form W-2 to report payments to your employees, such as wages, tips, and other compensation, and withhold income, social security, and Medicare taxes. So the W-2 is probably the most common form that we know of, but it's still quite complicated. Remember that there's a big difference between doing an employee situation having to withhold money process payroll taxes deal with the 941s the 940 issuing the w2 and the w3 and then just giving someone a 1099 form it's a lot easier to give someone a 1099 form <laughs> but but so so keep that in mind it doesn't mean you don't want to have employees just note there's a there's a big you know difference there's pros and cons to, to both of those formats so you can file form w2 online for more information about form w2 see the general instructions for form w2 and w3 just want to note when you're dealing with payroll if you're thinking about taking on payroll it's a mess and it's it's you know it's not the easiest thing to do uh, so so you want to generally think about how you're going to do that well first meaning do you want to process the payroll through your tax software? Do you want to hire a third party payroll provider to help you process payroll? And I would first talk to someone that is not related to the person you're going to be paying for payroll, such as a CPA firm or something, asking them, what's my best options to deal with payroll? And then set it up properly the first time because uh, problems with payroll is the most likely area that small businesses get sued on and stuff like that. So you wanna make sure that it's set up properly uh, from the get-go if possible, which which a lot of small businesses get hung up on. Okay, so penalties. The law provides for the following penalties if you do not file forms 1099 miscellaneous, uh, forms 1099 NEC or forms W-2. So obviously the question here, as always, is what if I don't? What if I don't do that? Well, then they hit you with the sticks of penalties and interest, right? We're trying to avoid the sticks here. This isn't, it's, just, it's not like we're doing this just because, right? It's not helpful to the business to have to do these things. They're forced to do these things. And why? Because we're trying to, in, we're trying to avoid getting hit with sticks. So, uh, so, or do not correctly report the information. So for more information, you can see the general instructions for certain information returns. So failure to file information returns. Uh, this penalty applies if you do not file information returns by the due date, uh, do not include all required information or report incorrect information. Now, no, you might be asking, well, how would they know if I don't do an information return, right? But, but clearly, if you have a W-2, I mean, if you have like your form schedule, your Schedule C, on your Schedule C, you want to deduct, because these are going to be huge deductions, what you paid either an employee or a contractor. How are you going to do that? Well, if they're an employee, you would probably call it wages or payroll. Now, if you put something on your Schedule C that you deducted like 50,000 of payroll expenses and you don't report W-2 forms, you see, there's a problem. That's why the IRS has a leverage. The IRS can see that you want to deduct the payroll if you want to deduct the payroll, you have to process the payroll and be their tax collector and issue forms W-2. If you have a contractor situation, same thing. You might have paid $50,000 in contractor fees. Where are you going to deduct that? You're going to deduct it as contractor fees or something like that. 
And then if the IRS sees you've got 50,000 in contractor fees, but you didn't process any 1099 forms, they're probably going to be like, or they could quite likely ask how. That's why the IRS has the leverage, right? Because they're going to see the deductions and therefore they have the leverage. Do you want those deductions? They have the leverage to make you into their tax collector, collector or at least a rat, ratting out who, who you paid. <laughs> Any case, failure to furnish correct payee statements. So this penalty applies if you do not furnish a, require, a required statement to a payee by the required date. Do not include all required information or report incorrect information. So then you got the waiver of penalties. No penalty. So these penalties will not apply if you can show that the failure was due to reasonable cause and not willful neglect. This is often the case in, in law where the question is intent, which is a very difficult thing to, to determine. But if it was just neglect, ah, I didn't do it, I didn't know, then you're going to have less of a penalty oftentimes than if they say if, if it was intentional uh, and so on. So in addition, there is no penalty for failure to include all required information or for including incorrect information on a de minimis small number for information returns if, if you correct the error by August 1st of the year, the returns are due. So meaning a de minimis amount, you were off, you made an error, but it wasn't that big of an error. It's not material in comparison to the total dollar amounts as they determine it and you fix it. So a de minimis number of returns uh, is the greater of 10 or one half of 1% of the total number of returns you are required to file for the year. So that's a pretty small number. So form 8300, you must file form 8300, report of cash payments over $10,000 received in a trade or business. If you received more than $10,000 in cash in one transaction or two or more related business transactions, cash includes US and foreign coin and currency. So it also includes certain monetary instruments such as cashiers and traveler's checks and money orders. So cash does not include a check drawn on an individual's personal account, personal check, for more information, you can see publication 1544 reporting cash payments over 10,000. So you can see what the IRS is trying to do. They're trying to monitor transactions of a certain size uh, at now, right? And as things become more electronic, you, you could see what they're going to try to basically insert themselves into these electronic transactions and, and they'll be able to kind of regulate more, you would think, once that, once that happens, unless people start using things like cryptocurrency or something uh, w that don't have the same regulations within. I don't know. So penalties. There are civil and criminal penalties, including up to five years in prison for not filing form 8300, filing or causing a filing of a false or fraudulent form 8300 or structuring a transaction to evade reporting requirements. Okay, so uh, here's a going out of business checklist. So notice that when you start a business, it's actually easier sometimes to get the business up and running than, than kind of uh, putting, taking the business back down or taking it apart. Because now if, you file, if, now if you've got an EIN number and you're reporting 1099 forms, and if you go as far as structuring a, a separate type of entity like an S corporation or an LLC, those can be quite difficult to like, uh, to deconstruct, not, not totally difficult, but sometimes uh, there's a state and the federal component and sometimes they, it's a little bit of a problem to get them deconstructed. You wanna make sure that you close them properly or else you can, you can end up with issues and fees in the future and it's kind of a pain. So note the following checklist highlights the typical final forms and schedules you may need to file if you ever go out of business. For more information, see the instructions for listed forms. So you got the income tax. So if you are liable for income tax, then you may need to file Schedule C with your Form 1040 or 1040 SR for the year in which you go out of business and then file Form 479 says for with your Form 1040 or 1040 SR for each year in which you sell or exchange property used in your business. So you sold you know, business property like depreciable property or something or in which the business use of certain Section 179 
or listed property, file form 8594 with your form 1040-1040-SR if you sold your business. You got this SE tax, self-employment, file schedule SE with your form 1040 or 1040-SR for the year in which you go out of business. Employment taxes, this would only be the case if you had employees, not contractors. File form 941 for the calendar quarter in which you make final wage payments. Oftentimes when people go out of business, they kind of, they try to cut it off in the middle of the year. Like you went out of business in the middle of the year and you just drop finishing up the payroll taxes, right? Cause you didn't, you didn't do payroll for the last couple quarters of the year, but you still need to file the W2s and, and make sure you've done the 941s you need to in the 940. Otherwise payroll's a problem. You don't want to mess up payroll because the IRS is more crazy about payroll than most other things in part because like if if you withheld money from your employees as withholding taxes that you're supposed to pay to the government like social security medicare and federal income tax and you don't then not only did you not pay your own taxes you basically took money from your employees and then didn't pay the taxes right so it's it's actually a, a bigger problem kind of because it's kind of like you stole from the employees even though you were forced to withhold the money from the employees so do not forget to check the box and enter the the date final wages were paid then you got the form 940 that's another payroll form for the calendar quarter uh, year in which final wages were paid and then you got the information returns provide w-2s to your employees for the calendar year so even if you stop in the middle of the year you want to make sure you issue the w-2s close the business up as best you can try to try to end it wherever it's ended so that you can move on and the business doesn't kind of try to take you down for the next thing you're trying to do. I'm trying to move to the next thing here and the dang business keeps coming back like a zombie and trying to cut me down. I'll tell you what, anyways, don't let it do that. So file form W3s and file form W2, provide forms 1099 miscellaneous and form 1099 NEC to each person to whom you have paid at least $600 and then file form 1096 to uh, file forms 1099 miscellaneous. So that's the closing uh, worksheet. If you, if you have an S corporation that you set up or an LLC, you wanna make sure that you close those and that might take on the state as well, uh, making sure you close everything properly, not just on the federal side, but on the state side.